for our first speaker of today is Professor Katrine Hennessy. Right, Professor Hennessy is a gerontologist and professor of aging at the University of Stirling, where she's engaged in promoting interdisciplinary research on aging and older people. She's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America and has researched older people's health, well-being and care provision for over 30 years, both in the United States and the United Kingdom. All right, so the topic that she will be covering today will be on a cross-cultural perspective on family caregiving. All right, so without further ado, warmly welcome Professor Hennessy, please. Over to you, Professor Hennessy. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you for the first slide. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, and Thank you for attending this presentation in which I just want to try to uh, give you an example of the, the kind of topic that we cover in the, gerontology, uh, in the gerontology and global aging program. So this is kind of a, a mini lecture on family caregiving, which of course is a, a key topic in social gerontology. And it's an area in which I've done uh, research over the years with different cultural groups. So what I hope to do is just to give you uh, uh, some sense of the, of the kinds of common issues and similarities and, and differences in family caregivers' experiences in various cultural contexts. And, and I'll be focusing in particular on some research I did with uh, a particular ethnic population in the United States. So again, um, as Michelle said, please feel free to, to put any comments or questions you have in the chat and we'll have time for some questions at the end. Um, next slide, please. So, um, of course, you'll all be aware that globally, populations are aging through longer life expectancy and there's an increase in particular in the number of those in the oldest age groups who are going to need uh, health and social care assistance. So for example, um, after Japan, Singaporeans, uh, Singapore is the, the most rapidly aging country in Asia. Uh, in 2014, uh, older Singaporeans 65 and over made up 11.2% of the population. And by 2030, uh, it's now estimated that uh, one in five Singaporeans will be age 65 and over. So that's, as in other countries, a huge jump uh, in, in the older population. Also, uh, in many areas of the world, within the past generation, there have been significant changes in family structures, in family life, uh, and <clears throat> caregiving relations. For example, through the greater participation of women in the, in the workforce, uh, and also uh, in things like the rise of non-traditional family types, so, so single parent families. So in Singapore, for example, uh, just to use our example, close to 60% of women are working outside the home and because they're the main caregiver of older relatives, uh, like caregivers worldwide, they'll be faced with uh, balancing the demands of work and, and family. Just to give you an idea of some other cross cultural variation in family structure. In Singapore, for example, close to 95% of older people live with family members. But here in the UK, 2.1% of households in England and Wales are multi-generational family households. So include uh, more than two generations. So that's a huge difference. Um, in the, in the structure of uh, uh, household composition. 
Other factors that are changing the face of family caregiving include things like the introduction of new technologies, like online services and supports. Just for example, I have a student in Ghana who is setting up um, WhatsApp support groups with family caregivers in rural areas uh, in this African country. So the impact of, of technology is being felt uh, globally in terms of uh, resources available uh, to family caregivers. And then finally, uh, changes in social policies and differing cultural contexts contribute to the, the whole varied uh, picture of family caregiving today. Um, next slide, please. Right, so just turning to research on family caregiving, um, this dates from probably the late 1970s, early 1980s, and is largely based on theories around stress and coping responses. So um, is underpinned by theory that looks at how individuals in this case, caregivers react to situations or circumstances that they perceive as being stressful and how emotionally and behaviorally they adapt to, um, to these stressors. So uh, just to, to kind of summarize the, uh, the research from this perspective in a nutshell, it's looked at um, it, it has looked at the impact both on mental health and phys on, on physical health of family caregivers. And this, uh, and this is what the research globally has, has shown uh, for both those impacts. So very briefly, caregivers have higher levels of distress uh, compared to, to non-caregivers. Um, older caregivers, women and husbands and wives are are most affected among caregivers. Uh, and not surprisingly, dementia caregivers experience higher emotional distress than caregivers of physically frail uh, individuals. In terms of physical health impact, uh, caregiving strain contributes to all causes of mortality. And <clears throat> when you look at, say, immune system functioning uh, among caregivers, they have lower antibody levels and higher levels of stress hormones than non-caregivers. Uh, behavioral problems are also strongly associated with um, physical impact in, in caregivers. And older caregivers, uh, caregivers of, of um, relatives with dementia and men uh, show this association between caregiving stressors and health uh, most strongly. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. So as we've just seen, um, because the perception of, um, of caregiving as being something stressful um, has been shown to have impacts on, on the health and well-being of family caregivers, a kind of core concept, a, a central concept of research on family caregiving is this whole notion of caregiver burden. And, and gerontologists uh, have been working over uh, probably about four decades now on ways to, how, how best to effectively measure um, caregiver burden. And there have been probably dozens of instruments that have been developed to assess caregiver burden over this time. And, and we'll be looking at just one of these uh, instruments, which is called Zaret's Burden Interview, um, that is based on 22 questions. And it's often considered the kind of gold standard among these instruments, uh, both in research and it's also used um, extensively in in clinical practice. So next slide, please. So 
This just gives you some examples of these items. And each item on the interview is, is a, a statement which the, the caregiver is asked to endorse or agree with uh, using a five point scale. So going from never to nearly always um, and responding to questions like, do you feel that your relative asks for more help than he or she needs? Do you feel that because of the time that you spend with your relative, you don't have enough time for yourself? Um, do you feel stressed between caring for your relative and trying to meet other responsibilities for your family or work? And things like, do you feel that your social life has suffered because you are caring for your relative? So that just gives you an idea of the flavor of the questions. Um, as I said, this, this scale has been extensively used uh, cross-culturally. There are shorter versions of it, and it's been translated into um, many languages, and there is a validated um, there is a validated version for the Singaporean context. Um, next slide, please. So uh, now I'd like to turn to an example of research that I did on family caregiving uh, within a very different cultural context in the United States. And this was with uh, family caregivers of American Indian tribes. And just for your information, there are 563 nationally recognized uh, Indian tribes in the United States. Uh, with improvements in life expectancy among American Indians, which was only about 50, year, 50 years of age back in 1940, but that shot up to about 70 years um, in 1980. Uh, so now, uh, with this increase in life expectancy, they're one of the fastest growing groups of older people in the United States. Uh, but the healthcare system uh, hasn't yet caught up with the needs of this aging population. And there are still, or at the time I did this study, um, very few services specifically for older Indian people. And many of these uh, populations live on uh, reservations in, in quite rural and remote areas, which of course makes the delivery of services um, challenging a lot of times. So in the absence of many long-term care services, families provide most, or in some cases, all of the supportive care that's needed by older people, which is why we, we did this study uh, to look at um, the experiences of family caregivers and, and to give some recommendations for service development. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, just to give you a bit of context, I did this research with tribes in the southwestern region of the US. So that sort of bigger colored uh, area in, in the southwestern portion of the of the map here. And as you can see, in many portions of this area, American Indians make up the majority of the population. So in the dark blue areas, um, they constitute uh, over half and up to 100% of, of the population. Um, next slide, please. And Tribes in this area are among the most traditional uh, in the country. So their lifestyles um, continue uh, to be fairly unchanged. Um, they're agriculturalists and they're, they're pastoralists uh, and, and their economy um, revolves around that. And, and um, they are so traditional that, for example, many older people in these areas speak only their native language and, and they don't speak um, much English or, or quite limited English. Okay, next, next slide, please. Um, so older people, uh, 
in these in these tribes are held in quite high regard, um, and they're they're kind of treated as living uh, living treasures uh, because they're repositories of cultural knowledge and skills, and they're also speakers of their of their native languages. And some of these languages are are dying out, so you know their knowledge is is particularly prized, and the and the grandparent and grandchild relationship is regarded as particularly important in the extended family in terms of passing down knowledge and skills. And we'll see how, you know, how this affects family caregiving. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for a, a variety of historical reasons, uh, many of these communities are um, deeply affected by poverty, and uh, in a serve one survey we did, for example, about three quarters of households of older people were below the official poverty level. So this older woman uh, is standing in front of her home, which is is pretty typical of housing on on the reservation. Although there are still Many people, many older people um, who live in quite poor housing with, for example, no electricity, central heating or indoor plumbing, no running water. So imagine you'll, you'll see what some of the caregiving challenges are within this particular kind of context. Um, <clears throat> in many of the tribes where we were conducting this research, uh, people tend to live with or close to uh, the uh, vicinity of their extended family. And so multi-generational households are the norm in, this, in these communities. And of course, this is part of the cultural context that has important implications uh, for family caregiving to older people. So next slide, please. And I'll just show you one or two pictures that just suggest that, you know, that these are beautiful landscapes. This, this is a, a gorgeous area of the country, but um, it, it the circumstances of older people are often in kind of stark relief uh, to the uh, to the landscape and and caregiving, as you will see, is uh, can be a real challenge. Uh, and then the next slide, please. Thank you. So just to introduce our research a bit, our, our we did research on family caregivers that involved um, a survey of family caregivers, and we also conducted focus groups with the main caregiver, the primary caregiver of uh, caregivers of an older person who needed assistance with uh, a certain level of activities of daily living and with their health care. So the, the survey that we carried out um, involved the kind of usual questions and caregiving research about which family members are providing care, um, what kinds of care were, was provided, uh, the, the extent of care that, that uh, was needed by um, the older person, and the kinds of problems that caregivers uh, experienced. And next slide, please. I just want to show you, um, these are some examples of uh, the survey. Um, and, and I just, with this example, I just want to show you how we had to adapt questions to make them culturally appropriate to the circumstances of this tribe. So we wanted to ask a question about how much physical activity, uh, you know, these caregivers got, because of course that's pertinent to their, to their health, to maintaining their health. But so the first question really was the kind of appropriate way to ask this. So we asked, how often do you get exercise such as walking, herding sheep, chopping wood or riding horseback. <laughs> That's um, to, to, to make this really reflect the, the circumstances of these caregivers. Uh, if you go down to uh, the second from the last question, dreams in, in these cultures, dreams are considered 
uh, dreams are taken very seriously and they're a real factor in people's mental health. So we asked a question about, do you have any recurring dreams that are, that are upsetting you? And, and then the last question, um, usually um, in asking about how, uh, how much memory problems are an issue for the, for the care recipient, uh, you would ask a question about, um, oh, if the person knows, uh, knows who the president is or what year it is, for example, what the date is. But in this, um, in this setting, we asked a question about how much a problem it is for the, for the older person to remember what season it is. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of how how we adapted these questions to, to fit these circumstances. Next slide, please. And then again, for the physical environment, these were more questions from the survey. These particular questions reflect the fact that in that many homes uh, didn't have electricity. They also didn't have indoor toilets. So um, this is a very different setting than most of us are, are accustomed to. And these things shape these caregivers' needs uh, and experiences. Next slide, please. And when we were designing our survey of family caregivers, we wanted to include questions about uh, their perceptions of caregiver burden, but we didn't want to just march in there with um, with a questionnaire that hadn't been uh, validated for these particular populations, and they hadn't been. So we wanted to see what we we used a group, one group of caregivers, to see what they felt of they felt about the particular questions that were included in this scale, and 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 these are these are adaptations of the Zaret burden scale that I mentioned earlier. And it very interestingly, the 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 people in the the caregivers in the focus group said that issues that had to do with the personal impact, um, be your the personal impact of burdens like time for yourself or or privacy or effects of caregiving on your social life. They said that they didn't really make sense to them within the extended family context. Uh, but more important for them um, was any kind of question that had to do with the burden of caregiving that was experienced in terms of the impact on the family group or on the tribe. So these, these um, caregivers are very much oriented towards um, not just, not their needs as an individual so much as the needs of the of the family, um, which is a very particular cultural orientation. Okay, next slide, please. So one theme that came out strongly in the focus groups was a sense of how their cultural identity as Indians. Um, is reflected in, in caregiving to elders. And I just want to read you one of the quotations because um, someone said, as you grow up, you learn to respect your elders because they took care of you when you used to be younger. So you sort of have the obligation inside of you to where you should take care of them. And I think that follows for all Indians. And they contrasted this with what they perceived as being um, white caregivers, um, uh, attitudes towards caregiving and 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 putting putting their relatives in nursing homes, which they said they would they would really never do. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So we also uh, identified some of the major themes related to sources of caregiver burden in the the focus group uh, interviews. And the first one of these was uh, the, really the challenges of managing medical care within the home setting. And this particular quotation is talking about 
you know, the difficulties of managing uh, severe complications of diabetes within the home setting and just um, just by the by, um, diabetes is hugely prevalent in these in these tribes. So imagine uh, managing, you know, the uh, amputation, you know, the an amputation uh, from diabetes within the home with limited support from healthcare professionals and huge distances sometimes between you know where the person lives and and healthcare facilities so that was mentioned as a real um, source of stress next slide please um problems and, and uh another big theme was around having to provide psychosocial uh support to the older person so problems for example um, with like a, a, the older person having depression or being non-compliant with, with treatment was identified as um, stressful by caregivers who said that healthcare professionals really sort of just left that to the family uh, and didn't act, offer any kind of active support for these kinds of, of challenges. Um, next slide, please. And then um, strains on family relations uh, were a particular source of burden. And I've I've talked about you know the importance of the of the extended family um, in in our um, and, and and the participation of uh, extended family members in the caregiving picture. So our survey told us that seventy eight percent of our uh, caregivers reported that <clears throat> other family members were involved in the caregiving picture. So there was a whole wide range of relatives involved in the in the caregiving picture. For example, um, close to 20% of um, close to 20% of those uh, family caregivers had other family members, um, so for so not not spouses or sons or daughters uh, or grandchildren, but other relatives from the wider extended family involved in the caregiving picture, and it was particularly stressful for caregivers when they couldn't coordinate when there were stresses and strains in the in the family situation, and they couldn't. Um, coordinate care as well as it needed to be coordinated. And they found that to be a real burden. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, of course, as with caregivers everywhere, negative effects on, uh, on personal health and well-being, things like, you know, be, having your sleep interrupted, uh, the physical and emotional challenges of caregiving that led to um, that led to health and and well being problems. So one young woman uh, was talking about caring for her two grandparents, and she said, "My back has been hurting. I pick her up the wrong way sometimes. I pull the muscle in my spine." And this is while she was chopping wood for the indoor stove, and my back was hurting for almost two weeks. I kept pulling myself to try to keep uh, to try to keep them warm, and I had to struggle for six days to come back down, do the same things, go back up, and do the same things, and to to haul water out of the well uh, for household use. So, as you can see, um, the whole context of caregiving and some of these caregiver caregiver situations were particularly um, challenging. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but caregivers also told us about the kinds of sources of satisfaction um, that that they had, and these were around three three particular points. One had to do with being able to successfully routinize um, the care regimen. So. Um, 
being able to uh, use particular tricks and tips to um, to manage the care routine smoothly. And that was a kind of learning curve for caregivers. But once they could achieve that, that gave them a, a certain degree of satisfaction. Um, the second source of, of satisfaction uh, had to do with, as I said, um, just achieving harmony and family consensus uh, around, around the caregiving situation. And then finally, um, being able to get occasional respite from caregiving, uh, a break uh, away from the caregiving situation, if that was possible, was very important to being able to go back uh, to these caregiving responsibilities, which people were, were happy to take on because caregiving was a very culturally, um, a culturally important family responsibility. But all caregivers wanted in some cases was the occasional break from caregiving. So taking all our findings together, we made a number of uh, recommendations to the Indian Health Service for the development of um, services um, to, to, to caregivers and, and to older people. And these included um, developing some formal programs of caregiver training, um, looking at the possibilities for caregiver and family support groups, um, further developing um, or strengthening the, the case management system so that there was better continuity of care with um, healthcare providers and their communication with, with family members. And then finally, um, developing some options for respite care and um, things like adult day health care. And then the last slide, please. So, so I'd like at this point to um, return to the Singaporean uh, situation just to do a little bit of comparing and contrasting with what I've just shown you um, as, a, as a background to, to this study. Um, there was a there was a national it was the first one national Singapore survey on informal caregiving that was done in 2013 and that focused on the informal caregivers of of persons 75 years and above and 77 percent were of these caregivers were adult children of the, the older person and among the caregivers uh, over half were in paid employment so would be experiencing the kind of work and, and caregiving challenges and um, trying to achieve a kind of balance with those responsibilities uh, that of course other caregivers experience too. Um, but a, in a recent qualitative study, this is from 2017, um, a, uh, and this included family caregivers of older persons in Singapore, these caregivers particularly identified physical, emotional, psychological, uh, and also financial stresses in their roles of caregivers. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll just read you out a, a quote from this study. One caregiver daughter said, occasionally I am unable to help him. On three occasions, I hurt my wrist while trying to help him. I mean, that, that, pretty much echoes what we just heard from the, the Indian caregivers. So same kinds of physical and emotional uh, challenges as half, uh, half the way across the globe. Um, family caregivers in this study also emphasized the strong sense of filial duty or responsibility that motivated them to continue care despite the kinds of stresses they experience. So uh, another caregiver in this Singaporean study said, I'm just doing my duty as her child. She took care of us uh, till we were all grown up. So now it's our turn to take care of her. So she took care of us in the past. So now we must take care of her. So it, this just echoes uh, these, you know, what, what uh, the Indian caregivers said. So very, 
similar sense of um, caregiving responsibility. And then the final issue, and I'm just uh, just about to uh, come to the end here, uh, if the final issue identified as stressful for these caregivers was managing uh, the care of the older relative with the help of um, a foreign domestic worker um, who was living with the family. So um, the National Survey of Caregivers that I, I mentioned a little earlier show that close to, um, to half of all caregivers uh, in Singapore employed a live-in foreign domestic worker. Um, and, and these caregivers said that coordinating this support with, with their own work responsibilities and possible other family members uh, being involved in the, in the picture, in the caregiving picture, was very frequently a source of, of stress for them. And the authors of this study uh, concluded the findings point to the need for improvement in policies, training, and support for caregivers. So very much along the lines of um, what I found with another group of caregivers. So, um, so that's uh, the end of the, the presentation. I'm Siling. Uh, I have been working with the university for about 15 years to date. And this is our this year marks our 11 year partnership with SIM. Okay. Uh, a little bit background about the university where Catherine and Madel work for. We are founded in 1967. So this makes us about 56, 57 years old. And we are leading university in the research area of uh, sports, of gerontology, uh, marketing, management, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, Grace, can you have the next slide? Grace, can I have the next slide? Okay. Yeah, okay. As per any university who is uh, selling our programs in Singapore or uh, inviting prospects to join our program, these are some of the achievements that we have achieved over the years. Okay, we are five star waiting for teaching, research, employability, internationalization, inclusiveness, and facilities. Okay, this is according to the QS World University ranking in 2023. And we are also ranked top 20 in the UK for postgraduate teaching, top 40, on the 49th overall in the Guardian University Guide, and top 20 in the nursing and psychology. Of course, some of these uh, rankings that we have achieved may not really uh, resonate with you well because this is all happening in the UK. But rest assured, I just mentioned to you this year's marks the 11 partnership with us. And for the university itself, we've actually set foot in Singapore for about 40 years. Okay, we started off with uh, masters in uh, retail, uh, masters in retail management. And till today we have uh, been in Singapore for 40 years. So if you wish to join our program, I hope uh, see you soon okay in, in september okay grace can i pass it to you thank you Celine. Welcome. okay uh, so uh for this program why we have this ma master of gerontology and global aging with the university of story because story is actually home to the dementia service development center so it's actually an international center of knowledge and expertise dedicated to improve the lives of the people with dementia through in UK, Europe, China, and Australia on dementia-related issues and training and consultancy for the private sector. They also have extensive international focus and opportunities to learn from a variety of researchers, practitioners, and also business, ranging from a different range of disciplinary backgrounds with global and international experience with uh, whose research is actually focused on aging issues. And Sterling has a solid foundation for progression to doctorate studies, and they are actually a world-class education in social gerontology and aging studies. So what is this program? Who are the target uh, uh, to sign up for? People who are actually working directly or indirectly in policy, research, practice, health provision, or you have business roles related to aging and older elders, or you have planned to start a career in this area. So uh, for our program, we also welcome practitioners, 
professionals from overseas to join us. So what is the learning outcome you get from this master program? Upon completion of this program, students will be able to demonstrate detailed knowledge of gerontology, global issues, and initiatives in policy or practice in the field of aging. They'll have a critical understanding of the principal theories and research methods used within gerontology and aging studies. And we hope that you can actually apply the extensive detail and critical analysis to our global aging issues using both local and international examples. And you'll be able to develop, develop knowledge and skills that can be utilized within healthcare practice settings and policy or business areas related or associated with older people and the aging populations. So this is actually our program structure. It's actually a two-year program. So uh, for the first semester, it's actually in, from September to December. We have actually two modules, the inter the interdisciplinary perspective of aging, research methods in the social sciences. So come January and April, we have another two modules that will be running. So uh, this is actually the structure itself. So if you have any questions related to modules, feel free to email or touch base with us later also. So the key items for you to take note, it's actually a 24 months part-time program. So this is ranging from September 2023 to April. Then you have a break and it will continue from September 2024 to May 2025. The module delivery will be two modules per term. So it ranges around 10 weeks. It's actually a eight, uh, 180 credit program. So there'll be seven modules with 20 credit and the 40 credit for your dissertation. It's actually a, a blended learning. So the program will be taught online by stirring faculty. Then we'll actually have face-to-face -face tutorial support by qualified local associate lecturers. And the online activities actually include a mixture of guided studies, uh, independent studies, online discussion boards, as well. Assessment will be actually including like word, uh, written assessment, online exams or reports or presentations and case studies on your uh, or online discussion boards. So the admission criteria will be actually you need how to have a minimum of second class honors specialist degree, experience of working with older elder populations in healthcare population or business setting or research experience with older population is recommended. All other qualifications will be reviewed on a case by case basis and may be subject to interview. So don't worry about the criteria. Please feel free to apply accordingly. Uh, the, there's a basic English language requirements. If your degree is actually not obtained in English, the uh, English medium, you are required to meet the following uh, criteria. This is the program fee for our September intake. The application fee will be uh, $97.20. $97 the program fee for the whole program is actually $30,240. Uh, these fees are inclusive of the 8% GST and are payable on a modular basis before each module commence. So our coming important dates to take note is our application closing date will be 10 of July 2023. Our class commandments will be in September 2023. So if you have any queries with the program, please write to us at this email address and we'll actually contact you as soon as possible. If you have any questions after today's event, after today's talk, you can always drop us an email either to uh, Mr. Earl, who is the program manager, or to our SI admin staff to Grace Barry via this HE3 email address.